David Montes. I'm going to ask him to come up real quick because he has a heart for business. And as he's coming up, let's give him a hand clap as he comes. Come on. Here's a book that we're getting the series from Michael Maiden, Turn the World Upside Down. And this will be the last week I remind you of that. But just wanted to show you a book to invest in where your pastor was really blessed. This is where I got a lot of the ideas. But, uh, David, you had come to me or, or texted me uh, over your time at a business conference that you went to recently at Hilton Head. You are so blessed. We look up to you in so many ways. Yes, come on. And you texted me something. I want you to share it with the people because it's so about what we're going to talk about today. You texted me about something. Somebody testifying there and how successful they were. Yeah, well, we were, uh, praise God, uh, we were at a, a business convention, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, there was a $3 million a year earner there. He's, he's been in brokerage for, for almost 30 years. And basically what he said is um, you can't go home, slap the wife, kick the dog, and slap the kids on the way out, and then be a person in business that's successful. It won't, it won't amount to anything. And he talked for 45 minutes on being a man of God, being a husband to your wife, and loving your kids. And then he said everything else will translate into your business. So that was a blessing to hear and that he had that, that, that uh, order in his life. So. Amen. Let's give it up for Montes. Thank you for sharing that, my brother. Amen. And that was with Prime America. Amen. We have some people that work with that company if you're interested in having them uh, do some financial planning for you. So here, uh, David texts me and goes, Pastor, I'm, I'm listening to a guy that's making multi-millions of dollars, and he's saying that before we make multi-millions of dollars, we've got to put God first. Isn't that incredible? Why don't we hear that enough in our culture? You know why? Because we're mostly looking up to the Bill Gates, the, the Donald Trumps, the people who don't put God first. And we, as a culture, need to go back to the founding roots of this country. Our country was built upon men and women of God. They didn't do everything right. They weren't perfect. But their principle was in God we trust, not in money we trust. So I, I'm going to ask today whether you are a business owner, hope to own a business, or whether you work for a business, that today you'll see how you can be a part of the influence, the change of God in that place. Amen? Amen? Because you can make a difference. I don't know if anybody ever saw Undercover Boss. Anybody ever see that? But these CEOs come undercover to check out their companies. And you know who they're always most impressed with? The people who do what would be the dirtiest job, the most minimal job, but they do it with integrity. Those CEOs say, if you don't do this right, we all fail. But because you do this right, you're a backbone of this company. So it doesn't matter if you're in business for yourself, if you're a small part of your company working part-time at Starbucks, some of our college students, if you work for the city, we have police officers here, a hospital nurse, it doesn't matter where you are, you can be a person of influence when you do what you do as unto God, because the Bible says, do all things as unto God, amen? Amen. Thank you. Let's look to Matthew 28, 18. This is the scripture for all of the mountains of influence. This is what Jesus said. He came to them and declared, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Can somebody say, make disciples? Thank you. Make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Now, when we say that, you might think to yourself, well, I'm not a pastor, so that's going to be somebody else's job. But this is why we're doing this series today. We're doing this series because we know that most of you are going to go to a place of business tomorrow. How many of you have a job or something you're going to do tomorrow? Okay, how many of you wish you had a job and something to do tomorrow? Okay, you need to talk to those who raise their hands. Maybe they'll help you get a job. Let's try this again. How many of you have a job and you're going to go to work tomorrow during this week? Okay, amen. Thank you. We are all going to go to our work. Now, for me, I'm a Bible college professor, so that keeps it easy for me to make disciples, right? And you might say to yourself, Pastor, I have to go be a manager at the dollar store. Pastor, I've got to go be a nurse. Uh, Pastor, I've got to go work construction. I've got to go work at Starbucks. I have to go be a nanny. I have to go be a delivery man. I have to go be a repairman for the city. I have to go work on computers. How can I make disciples? I'm a salesperson. I'm a saleswoman. How can I make disciples? Well, today we're going to show you how to do that. You're not going to violate the, uh, the protocol of your business. We're not going to ask you to be the spiritual weirdy on your job. Woo! Hallelujah! You know, just all the time, weirdy, until you get fired and then you're suffering for Jesus. Okay? You're not going to be the weirdy out there. Okay? We're going to show you how you can make a difference by being the best you can be on your job. 
and then giving glory to God. But I want to introduce somebody to you first. Will you get the video for me, please? I want to introduce to you Mr. Green, the owner and founder CEO of Hobby Lobby, the biggest hobby business in the world, not just America, in the world, rivaling even to Walmart. And I want you to see today his Christian values and how he placed God in his life. And not only he as the owner, but also as the people who work with him are making a difference in the real world today. Would you play that for me, please, Andrew? Thank you. In my junior and senior year in high school, uh, I took a course called Distributive Education. Because of that, I was able to get out of school by about 11.30 and go down to the local five and dime store and work during my junior and senior years. And I found myself loving the work and loving retail, and uh, I, I took to it. I said, you know, this is something I think I could do. I don't know that my mother and father, being ministers, really understood that we all have a calling on our lives. And uh, as a result of that, after I got into retail, I really felt like I was a second-class citizen and a second-class Christian. And it took me some time to learn that, you know, God had a purpose for my life as well as any of my brothers and sisters, which all five went into the traditional pastor, pastor's wife, evangelist. During a time when I was actually a store manager at at uh, a variety chain, I decided to start manufacturing something just to go in business for myself. And so we started manufacturing really small miniature frames in our garage, and that's how we got started in business for ourselves. And from that manufacturing, uh, we used the profits to open up our first store, 300 square feet, which is about the size of a living room. And then after that, we, we made an, enough profit to take it to a 1,000 square feet, which was a big, big move, we thought, at the time. But over the years, we've, God has blessed us, and we have continued to add stores. And uh, we're at the point this year where our sales are going to be $2.5 billion. And God has blessed us to be a very profitable company. Every day there's decisions around here that has to do with, is this what? Christ would have us to do and so we try to, to ask those questions there's many times that God tests us in terms of dollars and cents like when he was dealing with us on, on opening on Sunday we said you know this is what God would have us to do at that time we were doing a hundred million dollars on Sunday not that we've always made the right decisions but hopefully that we are very sensitive to uh, finding out what Christ would have us to do in our business. Uh, we don't uh, set our Christianity on the shelf when we come to work. Um, it is a part of our work. I think it should have an influence on every decision uh, because as a Christian, that means that we are following Christ. Uh, that means that every decision that we make should be guided and directed uh, by Christ that lives within us. It's a unique company to work for um, with uh, such core Christian uh, principles that, that dictate so much of what we do here that really kind of says it's not just about words, it's not just here's what we say, it's let us show you how we live. The employees really feel the love that the Green family has for them. Um, they support a lot of ministries that invest in their lives. We're just grateful to be able to see not only the lives that it's touching here, but they take this information home and it's making a big impact in their family as well. I feel like the Lord has put these 20,000 employees in our charge, and he spoke to me about that at one time, and I thought at the time it meant only their spiritual, and as a result of that, we've hired three chaplains, but it, you know, when I gave it more thought, I think he also meant in terms of their financial needs, and so we felt like that we needed to do all we could do, step up above what what's required of us. What is required of us is $7.25 an hour minimum wage, but the last couple of years we have raised the minimum wage to our full-time employees now is at $12. And in addition to that, we try to give them reasonable hours. That's why we're only open 66 hours a week. And uh, because we have taken care of our employees, they have taken care of us. It has been a good relationship. I walked into one of our break rooms recently 
one of the housekeepers was standing there. So I called her by name. I said, how are you this morning? She said, I'm just wonderful. She said, I clean restrooms and I clean floors to help David Green get the gospel spread worldwide. It doesn't matter who fills what position out here. There's that heart to please God in everything that is said and done. And that attitude comes from the Green family. This business uh, has been blessed by God. He has given uh, the family the skills and ability, the opportunity, the time, the ideas. All of these have come uh, in one way or the other from God. And so for us to lay claim to any of that would be wrong on our part. That helps us have the right perspective and understanding uh, and not feel like that it's ours to do whatever we want to with. So we legally have a document that says if this company is sold, 90% of it would have to go to various ministries and the other 10 would go towards maybe the health, maybe education, things of that nature for our great, great grandchildren. We do not own this company, but we're the stewards. God has given us the responsibility to be good stewards, and that we want to do. Come on, let's give it up for the Green family. The Green has got some green. Amen. The Green family got some green. And, and I want you just to hear the numbers that they were saying. I mean, it's just unbelievable. They started in a 300-foot storefront, square-foot storefront. That would be the size of our blue room or the yellow room with the children's room. And now they bring in over $2 billion. God told him to close his business on a Sunday. To close his business on a Sunday. And we can't even hardly get some business people to here to come on a Sunday. They're so busy. I was talking to uh, somebody yesterday, uh, you know, at a family event. And I said, hey, man, why don't you come to church tomorrow? He said, no, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I said, what are you busy doing? He says, well, I repair, I repair PlayStations and Xboxes. I said, well, how much do you get paid to do that? Well, maybe $100. And I said, man, I'll give you $100. You just show up to church. I mean, come on, what is worth it to you? Your soul is worth more than $100. But you know what Al Green sacrificed to close his business on Sunday? A hundred dollars? A hundred thousand dollars? A hundred million dollars. You heard him. A hundred million dollars. And guess what? The Lord gave it back to him over six days of work. Six days of work. They increased past that hundred million in what they were doing in seven days because God was blessing them. Another thing that you heard him saying there is that if this business is sold, 90% of it's going to go to the church. So if there's some type of a hostile takeover, whatever, hey, the profits, nobody's getting them. We're going to give them to the ministry. This man, by his tithe and the church tithes, have helped Joel Osteen get that place that they have in Houston. They tithe upwards of um, $10 million, $20, $100 million a year towards ministries off that $2.5 billion. They are givers. And then you heard something there as well that stuck out to me, stewardship. And that's what I want to talk to you today about is stewardship. Because it doesn't matter if God has given you millions of dollars or just thousands of dollars or even if you are a teenager right now and you have tens of dollars, just ten dollars, God wants you to be a steward over what he has given you. Everybody say stewardship. Amen. And I just want to add something in here as well. He said he was brought up in a pastor's family, and they all wanted him to go into ministry. But when he went into the, the, the work field, they didn't accept him. They thought that he was like a, a, you know, not a real citizen of the kingdom of God. It wasn't until later that he got accepted. I, I think I know when he got accepted, when he started writing his tithes checks to the church. Amen. And that, that's when Dad was okay with it. He's like, hey, man, woo, praise the Lord. I'm glad my son owns a business. That's just an inside joke for me because he said it took a little while. And I'm like, I bet you the moment you wrote mom and dad a tie check, they understood. We're happy that you went into the, the business world. And look at this uh, today, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about shrewdness and stewardship. Everybody say shrewdness and stewardship. Thank you. Here are two biblical principles that we can learn from the Bible about business. And before I even get into this, if you're wondering if Jesus talked about business, he talked all the time about business. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked more about business and money than he did about heaven. Oh, it gets quiet. Not even hearing an amen on that. I'm going to say that again. Jesus talked more about business and money than he did about heaven. Do you know why? Because in every parable, whatever Jesus used, it always pointed towards responsibility. 
He knew that you being a Christian would not be a cult member living on a commune. He knew that you would be placed in this world as salt and light. And so all of his examples are examples of managers with, with their stewards, with a gardener and their vineyard, with an owner and their land. All of his examples involved, 90% of them involved business. Even the prodigal son, when you think about what happens, he says, I'll just come home and be a servant and then my father will accept me. But no, the father puts a ring on him. What did that ring mean? You're back in daddy's business. You see, he always used examples of business because he understood that it's kingdom business that we can see in this world. See, because my business, if it's in his business, that's kingdom business. I mean, y'all going to learn that. I might, you know, going over, but we're going to preach it a little bit here. Look with me in Luke chapter 16, 1 through 13. Now, to, to talk about shrewdness here, to do justice to these scriptures, we're going to have to really read the whole passage, because if I just go over this quickly, you're not even going to believe what Jesus said. I can already tell it right now. Some of you are going to be like, Jesus didn't say that. So we're going to read it in its context. Are you all ready? Can you say I'm ready? Amen. Thank you. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So there's a rich man, he has a business, and he has a manager. His manager has been accused of wasting what the boss has. Let's go to verse 2. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. Okay, do you understand that what's going on here? A guy is getting fired. This is an example that Jesus gives us. A lot of times we think that Jesus just accepts everybody and just always says, hey, you're going to heaven just the way you are. No, the Bible says you have to be born again to get into heaven. Otherwise, you're fired going into the fires. Everybody with me? Jesus is not Barney and he's not Mr. Rogers. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, amen? So when he gives examples about people getting fired, these are examples to us of getting in some trouble in life, and he'll fire us if we don't do what he wants us to do. I'm just preaching before I get the whole story out because I want you to understand he is telling telling us there's a rich person that's putting their manager on the line saying, what have you been doing? You've been wasting, you're fired. God's going to hold you accountable one day. Get ready for it. Now watch what this manager does. He says, what shall I do? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So he's going, man, I can't go into construction. I don't have the hands to do this. I, I'm too weak to do this. And then he's like, I'm too ashamed to go beg. He doesn't want to go on the side of the road with a sign. He says, verse 4, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he gets an idea. Somebody say an idea. Thank you. He gets an idea, a creative idea, shrewd. Verse 5, he says, so he called on each one of his master's debtors, and he asked first, how much, does my ma how much do you owe my master? So now he's talking to the people who owe his master money. He says, how much do you owe him? The guy says, 800 gallons of olive oil. He replied, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Now see what's going on right here. He's knowing he's going to lose his job. But part of his job was to work with other business people. So he says, for me to have a job when I get fired here, I'm going to become the friends of my boss's customers. So if I get fired, I'm going to go back to my customers, my boss's customers, and go, hey, you remember I changed your bill? Can you give me a job? Now right here we may say to ourselves, well, this is a bad thing. But you know what he's doing? Do you know if you have credit card debt and it's so beyond what you can pay, if you call them up and say, I'll settle and pay this much right here, do you know that some creditors will take that? You see, what he's doing is he's saying, guys, you're not paying 800 but would you pay 400 So he starts getting income to his boss as well because he's cutting down their debts and he's doing it to save his own skin. It's not me telling the parable. It's Jesus. Y'all with me? I'm just explaining it. Okay. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. Take your bill. Make it 800 Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly everybody say shrewdly why was the boss happy he was cutting bills even though he was dishonest because he was now starting to turn a profit he did more now knowing he was going to get fired than he had done when he was trying to do his own job you know sometimes when people get threatened with being fired then they start working well that's what happened but he's dishonest what was he dishonest about he didn't tell his manager what he was doing that's never good it's never good to lie 
But the manager looked past that. The manager commended the dishonest, or the master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. What is that definition of shrewdly? We'll get to it in just a moment, but I want to tell it to you now. The definition of being shrewd is to act wisely with creativity. So the man knows he's going to lose his job. He starts cutting deals to save his own skin. The master says, hey, you're actually doing pretty good. You're actually getting some money to come. I couldn't get that guy to give me 800 barrels of oil. Now he's giving me 400. Couldn't get 1,000 bushels. Now I'm getting 800 bushels. You're doing pretty good. The master commended him. Now watch this because this is where Jesus sticks it right towards us. For the people of this world are more shrewd in their dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Some of you will probably never even knew that was in your Bible. That's why I had to have you read it. Use worldly wealth to get friends. Jesus said that? Yes, he did. Read it again. I tell you, use worldly wealth. What are we supposed to use? Worldly wealth. Everybody say, one, two, three. Worldly wealth. To do what? Somebody say, gain friends. Gain friends. So that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. He said, the people of this world are more shrewder than you are. Because we're children of light, aren't we? So he's actually pointing the finger right at us as he's saying, you know what, there's people downtown that want to make money for themselves, spend it on themselves, then you want to make money to spend it on the things of God. Shame on you. You're lazy. You're not as strong as a businessman as they are to make their kingdom to build my kingdom. You're happy with the little you have. You're not shrewd enough. That's what he's saying to us. He's pointing out to us. He says the people of this world are more shrewd and dealing with their own kind than the people of light. How many know there's people right now that are using money for their own means right now? They're doing whatever it takes. They're working 80 hours. They're cutting deals. They're coming up with advertising. They're stealing customers all so that they can have more money. And he says they do it for themselves. They're more shrewder than you are to do it for me. To get out there and to make things happen for me using worldly wealth. Oh, come on. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little will be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, how will you be trusted with real, true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, how will you be given property of your own? And then he says here to guard our hearts, he says, no servant can have two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. See, you've heard that before, but you never probably understood the context. The context is in Jesus telling you to use worldly wealth. And then he guards you and he says, but don't you ever love it. You use it. But don't you love it? You know, we hear all these rap songs, you know, and these songs from the 70s. Money, 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 money. You know, we hear all these songs about money, but you never hear a song about hammer, 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 hammer. Washing machine, washing machine, washing machine, washing machine. You know, you never hear a song about that. You see, money is just a tool. It's just like a washing machine, a hammer. It's a tool. We're supposed to use it for something. Not to love it, we're to use it. And what are we supposed to use it for? To gain friends. Oh, it's quiet. I'm going to say it again. I tell you to use worldly wealth. To do what? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior this morning? Am I lying? Did I sneak in and put this in your Bible? Did I get in your house and put it in your Bible? In your Bible? Is, are we all reading the same Bible? Okay, now I'm going to tie it together so you can see this today. Shrewdness is to act wisely with creativity. You are going to be judged on what you did with your resources. The business world thrives on creativity and new ideas. The people of the world are more shrewd to make money than are Christians. While on this earth, Christians need to use resources to win souls. Don't love money. Use it as a tool. Is this building paid for by the good smiles and wishing of the people here? No, it's paid for by dollars and cents, isn't it? You see, if you don't go out there and use worldly wealth, we can't win people to the Lord here. You have to go out there and go get it. If you're not successful on your business, somebody else is. Hey, let's keep it real. Somebody else is. 
Any business you're a part of, just, you know, naming off companies of people I know here, and I'm not going to try to embarrass any of them. Starbucks has a manager, probably makes around 50000 a year. Why? They work hard at Starbucks. They're going to take that money, and they're going to put it towards their boat on the lake. They're going to put it towards a new horse, and their my, my friends, you know, Adam's manager has a horse stable. They're going to put it on a new horse. And guess what? If you don't work as hard as them, you don't get that job. You don't get that money to put them to the mission field. You can't support Africa and all the books that they need and all the orphanages that we need to build and all of those things. Why? Because you didn't work hard enough for it. You see, they're working hard for the sake of money. They love money and they're working hard. And they will outwork you. They will outperform you. They will sacrifice more than you. And then they will waste it on the things of this world. What Jesus Jesus is saying is when you get on that job, you be the best. You be the most creative. You do everything you have to do. When you get called into account, you stand before your manager and say, I'm doing the best I can do. Compared to everybody else, I've been faithful with little. I want much. Put me on the place for the manager. Put me in the place for the job promotion. Give me the new business, the new, the new location. God is asking you to be the best at what you do. And it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter, like I said, if you're the manager of the dollar store or if today you're going to, you know, uh, Monday you're going to go downtown and work in a multi-million, billion dollar company. We have people here who work for Coca-Cola. It doesn't matter where you go. Every business place is looking for success. And God says, you use it. You use it. You see, when was the last time you said, God, I want to use worldly wealth to gain friends in heavenly places? Oh, I just want money for my four and no more. Shame on you. Shame on you for only praying about your family. Shame on you. God is saying, you know what, you're not even thinking like the world does. You know what the world is all into right now? Just watch them on these celebrity shows. They're all about these, uh, these giving things, these charities. They love to be known for Angelina Jolie. Look what she does in Africa. Brad Pitt. Look what he, well, look what he does in uh, you know, uh, New Orleans. Shame on the Christians for not fighting for those positions to be the best so that we could say, yes, we brought in $3 million or yes, we brought in 30000 I don't care. It doesn't matter the amount. We're not trying to make you feel bad. Jesus didn't say an amount to try to make you feel bad like lower middle class people are not as good as upper middle. That is not the point. The point is where you are on your job, in your business, are you fighting to be the best? Are you asking God for shrewdness, for creativity, so that you'll be picked, not just so you and your family can have a nice house, so that you can supply the kingdom of God. I would rather you be the millionaire than your boss be the millionaire. God would rather you get those jobs than the next guy get those jobs. Do you support missions? Do you support offering? Do you support building fund? Your prayer needs to be, God, make me a blessing so I can use worldly wealth to win heavenly friends. Look at what, I mean, it's what the Bible says. If I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your money to win souls. Store treasures up in heaven. And so I pray, I pray. You don't think, let me just say this before I say what I'm going to pray. You don't think David Green has competition? You don't think people are trying to take money from his business? You don't think there's other companies trying to outdo him? Better deals, better advertising, more days. We're open on Sunday. We'll give you two for one on Sunday just to put him out of business. You don't think it's a dog-eat-dog world where he lives? You think people are just letting him make $2 billion this year? People are fighting to take him out, but they're praying for creativity. They're praying for shrewdness. They're praying for customer service. They're praying for cleanliness. They're asking God, and everything we do from the top on down, let us be bigger, let us be better, let us be more excellence to take out the competition. Come on, somebody. God wants winners. You're getting fired from a job. Now, there are things that happen that are out of your control. I don't want to make good people feel bad. But I'm just saying, you get fired from a job for not showing up, not producing, you need, to, you need to say you're sorry that you called yourself a Christian there. And you need to find out what your purpose is and get back on that next job and pick yourself back up and say, this is going to be different. I'm going to come early. I'm going to stay late. I'm going to outperform. If I don't know what they need me to do, I'm going to get trained on the side. I'll do whatever it takes to be successful here because I don't just have my family riding on me. God is expecting me to be more shrewd than the children of, of darkness are because I'm a child of light using worldly wealth to gain friends. Amen? 
people get all upset in the world and they say, well, all these pastors have this money. Well, you know, all those rappers have that money. All those sports stars have that money. I would rather have the church have the money than these bozos wasting it. I would, I would rather have pastors that I know. You, know. you know, New Life Covenant bought a $2 million property, going to build $25 million there. Shame on any of us as Christians to have a problem with that. You don't have a problem with the, 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 uh, the Trump Tower. You don't have a problem with the Sears Tower. You don't have a problem with Great America. You don't have a problem with Six. All of that. Shame on us as Christians. I would rather have Choco have $25 million by 10,000 people than to have it go to the world because they're going to win souls with it. Amen? Praise God. We're going to bless people, and we're not jealous of others. Well, look at that church. They bought this. I'm not jealous of them. We serve the same God. It's our God. Amen? It's not like Pastor Choco has a different God. That's my God that's blessing him. And if God is doing it for my big brother, he's going to do it for me. My turn is coming. Amen? Praise God. You better respect it. Amen? Don't, don't hate, appreciate. Praise God. And I'm telling you, man, you know, every business, and unless, unless you're a part of a business like Solyndra or some business that's meant to fail, I guarantee you go right now to your company and you ask them, do you guys want to win here? Do you guys want to succeed? Do you want hard? I guarantee you they're going to say yes, yes, yes. And you could say to them, I'm that person. Give me the ball, coach. I'm going to be the best I can be. Whether, like I said, whether it's delivering the product, whether it's making the product in the factory. I come from a small town in Indiana, you know, millionaires, probably a couple in the whole town, the whole city. You know, we come from a blue-collar town there. But you know what? You work hard. You become consistent at what you do. And then you work on the floor of the factory, you become the manager of the factory. Okay, you do whatever it takes, you become the best. Amen? Let me give you this last one here now, stewardship. Turn with me to Matthew 25, 14 through 20. You heard uh, David Green talk about this. And as we're turning here, let me just tell you a personal story. See, I'm a first-generation pastor. See, I'm the opposite of David Green. See, he came from all pastors, second, third generation, all pastors. All of his siblings are pastors. I'm the first pastor, excuse me, the first pastor in my family. That means, you know what my dad was? Businessman. You know what his dad was? Businessman. Came from Poland with nothing, worked hard, owned properties all over the city. He worked as a coal worker, then he worked as a, uh, then he came to the city here, he worked as a postman, saved up his money, bought one property, bought two property. By the time he, he, he died, he had tens and tens of properties, big apartment building. Came here as a Polish immigrant. My grandpa, my dad was a businessman, financial planner. See, I grew up with businessmen. My uncle's businessman. You understand? Businessman. I, I, that's, that's what I should have been in the world's mind, a businessman. And I understand what it takes, okay? But I also watched my dad start a business and it fail. I also watch him take risk and they not work out. I've watched people give it everything they have. But here's what you do as a Christian. What you don't do is you don't start robbing from God and then ask him to bless you. That's the first thing you don't do. Okay, even while my dad was losing his business, he still tithed because he knew the only way out of this was God. He's not going to come under a curse and then ask God to help him. You can talk to him when he comes there. 60-year-old businessman retired, gave while his business was going down because he knew, and it wasn't to me, okay? So don't think it's all about Joe or the pastor you're talking to. Okay, they're not trying to manipulate you guys. My dad went to his own church, and he gave the tithe to that pastor because he knew, hey, if I'm going down, God's coming with me. Because he's going to lift me back up. I ain't going through this by myself. Amen? Amen. And God gave him double for his trouble. As a 40-year-old man, he had to reposition himself, re-educate himself, go into a whole new business. My dad started in his 40s a business he had never done his entire life. And that business for the next years made him more successful than all the years he had ever done in business. Okay, but I grew up in a family where this is what we were taught. You give 10% to God. You give 10 You mow the lawn, Joe. You get $10 a week. You're giving a dollar to Jesus. Okay, we need to put that back on our minds again. We need to put that back in our heart again, that we're here for God. Amen? Look at the stewardship again. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. So here's another example. A man owns property. See, not everybody in the church is broke, busted, and disgusted, okay? This is a person that had some money. He had a property. He went on a journey. Then he gave one five talents of money. Somebody say, money. Amen. The other two talents, and then we'll, we'll just say this in our language, he gave one $5,000, another $2,000, and another $1,000, one talent, according to his ability. Okay, so some of us were like, you know what? God gave this person 5000 God gave me 2000 That's not fair. God said, it ain't up to you to decide what's fair. I'm the creator. 
I'm the creator. It's not fair that you were here in America and people are in India right now using the bathroom with their left hand. Do you want to play the fair game right now? It's not fair that you're walking with two legs and there's people, invalids, in a wheelchair right now. God decides on earth what talents you have, where you're born. All of that's called God's sovereignty. Amen? So wherever you open up your eyes and you say, here I am, then that's where you start. If you start in a wheelchair, you start in a wheelchair. If you're starting with all the talents you have, 5,000, it doesn't matter where you start in life. Just say, Lord, I'm your servant and your servant is listening. Amen? Okay, one he gives 5,000, another he gives 2,000, and the other he gives 1,000 according to their ability. Then he goes on a journey. The one who had 5,000 talents went at once, put his money to work. Somebody say, work it. Put his money to work and gained five more. Instead of 5,000, now he's got 10,000. Amen. Says the man who also had two talents gained two more. Come on, somebody say multiply. Praise God. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. See, now this is some of us what we think. We think, oh, God doesn't expect me to do much. God doesn't expect me to do much with my talent, so I'm not going to waste it. I don't serve the devil. Don't get me wrong. I don't kill, rape, or murder anybody. I'm a good person. But we put our talent right in the ground. Look what happens to this guy. Let's keep going. It says, after a long time. Somebody say, a long time. Come on, we're waiting for Jesus. It's been a long time, 2,000 years. The master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with him. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents, and I have gained five more. His master, uh, his master replied to him, Excuse me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 22. The man who had two talents also came and said, Master, you've given me two. I've gained two more. Look at verse 23. His master replied, Well done. Can everybody say, Well done? Thank you. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I am so happy for a God who blesses us. Amen? He wouldn't have to bless us. He, we could just be his slaves all the time. He could say, you know what, you just do it because I said so. I'm going to fry you on a barbecue called hell. But I'm so thankful God says, you know what, you serve me. I'm going to make life good for you. And then I'm going to bless you in eternal life and give you more than you've ever, ever seen, any, any eye has seen or ear has heard. He's being so good to these people. Now look right here, 24. Then the man who had received one talent came, Master. He said, I know you're a hard man. He said, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. That gives you an understanding of the work ethic of that master. You see, successful people are there for a reason. Even if they're some of these socialites who are these trust fund babies, for them to keep that money, they have to be successful. And they, somewhere along the line, if you look at a successful person, they had to be successful. They may be blowing that success now, but to have gotten there, to have stayed there, they had to work hard. Are you all listening? Amen. Let's not have class warfare here. People who got there. See, we look at Hobby Lobby. Oh, he's so rich. What does he understand? He had to work hard to get there. See, the people who own this building, I could say, all these landlords, they don't understand, charging us 8000 a month. They're just greedy. No, they had to work hard to get here, to own this building. See, we need to understand, people work hard to get what they have in this life. He said, I know that you're a hard man. Oh, come on. Somebody say hard man. Might remind you of your pastor a little bit. Come on, somebody. Hard man, hard working man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now you're thinking like little Dito Jesus is going to come up to him and go, Oh, Dito. Oh, you just a poor little thing. You just went out and just hit it. Well, I'm so glad you didn't spend it on crack. I'm so glad you didn't become a crack addict. Thanks for not using it on heroin. Yeah, guys, look, he didn't smoke heroin with the money. You see, so often we say to the other church members, well, at least I don't smoke crack, at least I don't do heroin. Yeah, I'm a good person. Look, I'm a good person. Do you give your time? Not really, but I'm a good person. Do you do anything for anybody else other than, you know, every now and then I give, I do a garage sale and I give them a discount. Come on, somebody. Look at what he said. You, you, you poor thing. Is that what he says? His master replied, you poor thing. I feel so sorry for you. Let me give you a bailout. No, he replied to him, you wicked, lazy servant. You wicked, lazy servant. You knew 
that I harvest where I have not sown, gather where I have not scattered seed? Why then should you have not just put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest? Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. This is the opposite of socialism, friends. You see, you think when we get to heaven, the one with ten talents is going to spread it out to all of you. That you're going to get a reward on your crime because of what somebody else did. No, my friend. If you don't live for God, you're going to get your reward taken, and it's going to go to the one with all the other jewels. Bing! Because Jesus is a capitalistic God. He is not here to try to make it feel fair for you. If you get an F on your test, but somebody gets an A, he's going to share that A, and you both get C's. It ain't happening like that, friends. He took the talent from the lazy servant and said, you know what? I'm going to give it to the one who had five and gave five more. He said, I'm going to, well then, you should have put the money to work, and then you would have received it back with interest. Take that talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten. For whoever, for everyone who has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Somebody say an abundance. So you don't hate. You need to celebrate. Woo, whoever does not have, whoever does not have, even that which he does have, will be taken from him. Now look at this. You think I'm playing? This is Jesus talking. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, some people come to this church and they say, Pastor, you, you preach hard and all this. You know what the problem is? People don't read their Bible anymore. I'm preaching like Jesus. You know, that, that person you celebrated, to, you know, the 25th, I preach like that guy. That guy called people worthless. That guy said he's going to throw people into hell who don't put to work the talents he gave them. We're not going to be rewarded for what we didn't do on this earth. Well, let's just reward them all, angels, for what they didn't do. This one could have been a real bad murderer and, and, and this. No, he's going to reward us for what we do. Stop talking about what you don't do. I don't do this. I don't do this. And I don't do... It don't matter what you don't do. What have you done for God lately? Here's what the Bible says. Summarizing. Stewardship. Entrusted to care for another's goods. You are given talents by God to use for His kingdom. Did you ever figure out yet? Have you figured out yet where you got the ability to be so good at what you're good at? You see, all Tim Tebow was doing in football is just giving the credit back to where it really came from. Have you figured out where your talents came from to sell, to build, to be a mechanic, to be a construction worker, to work in the warehouse, to be dependable? Have you figured out where your talents come from? They come from God. Last time I checked, you weren't forming your brain and brain cells in a laboratory and bringing that into your, you know, into your mind, okay? Last time I checked, you were using all that God had already given you. That's why it's just such an insult to live for money and greed. That's why the Bible says you will not serve two masters here. Because those people who have those talents, the Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates, and they think that was them, and then they spend money however they want on things that benefit them, God says you will be thrown into a lake of fire. You are a worthless servant. You did not know I gave you that mind. He gave Steve Jobs that mind. He gave Bill Gates that mind. There shouldn't be one church ever having to do a building fund because all of these successful businesses in America and the billions and trillions of dollars should be supporting their churches. The only reason why we have to do and you're good people and that's why you're here and you've got to help us out is because the empty chairs, they're not doing it with you. If everybody just did their part, we would always be like Moses and the people of God where Moses said, that's enough giving right now. We're good for today. We're, we got it now, guys. We gave our tithe, the offerings, way more than enough. Go and give it back to your family. We have enough here now. If all the businessmen, all the people up here on Old Irving Park, all the people, the landlords who own this building, if they all did what God told them to do with the talent he gave them, there would never be one building fund. All of our churches around the world would be being met. We spend more on dog food and pet food than we do on foreign missions. You, you, you see Petco? You ever see those stores? Go in there one day. People coming in and out buying stuff for their dog, buying stuff for their pets. We as Americans spend more on our pets. Nothing wrong with it. We got little, you know, fishes too. But I'm saying, <laughs> we spend more on that than we do on missions. Amen? It says, you are given talents by God for his kingdom. You will be rewarded for what you multiply. See, hear that? You will be rewarded for what you multiply. It's your job to multiply, to be the best at what you've been given. Like I said, it's not a dollar and cents thing. It's not a position. We're not saying everybody be a CEO and a millionaire, and if not, you're nothing in God's kingdom. My mother worked at a nurse's aide, as a nurse's aide. 
Okay? My dad lost a business. There's people in this church that do some of the most menial jobs in society, picking up garbage, sweeping floors, and working in the back rooms of warehouses, hot in the summer, cold in the winter. But that's not what God is talking. God understands that he's talking about people before take care of vineyards. Those are lowly people. He, talk, he calls himself a shepherd. We're not talking about judging each other by class right now. What we're talking about is wherever you are with the talents you have, are you multiplying them? Are you saying to your job, hey, man, I've been, I've been good at working this shift with the, you know, the, the 10 orders. You could put me in charge of 14 orders. I've been good at working on these vehicles. You could put me in the manager. I can train these 10 guys how to work. You know, it's just whatever you're saying is, God, to the boss, I'm dependable. Number three, if you bury your talent, you'll be punished. When you're faithful with little, you'll be given much. Amen. Would you stand up to your feet today? Can you bless the Lord for a good message on stewardship and shrewdness? Amen. Band, would you come? I hope it's blessed you today to encourage you to do awesome wherever you go tomorrow. Here's something in closing just to think about. No matter where you are in life, there's three T's that you can give to the Lord right now and be very successful in life according to God. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added. Here's the three T's of giving. We can all give our time. We can give our time. All of us have been given 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. We can give our time. Give your time to things that make God successful and your family successful. God, family. God, family. Bring your kids up in church. Make time for church. Give it to God. Volunteer with your kids. Do the Royal Rangers thing. Come on. So many things. Well, i got to take my kid here. I'm sorry, my kid doesn't have time to go to your Royal Rangers. Why not? Because they, they go to dancing, they go to this. They go, Come, are you serious? Do you want to face that on judgment? You may get into a lot of trouble for that. You better be careful. Because i got some guys here in the back that will tell you what happened when they went on Boy Scout trips. I'll tell you what happened when I was a part of football teams, what we talked about. My friends, parents, if all you do is keep putting them in secular things, they're going to lose the chance of getting a Christian worldview. Royal Rangers and Impact isn't just a little icing on, on the top of your cake. We're trying to say this is a good place for them to make friends, to, to do hobbies. It's a good place, okay? Time. We can all give time. Number two, we all got talents. Everybody has a talent. Let God use you in that. I just challenge you to pray, God, make me successful in what you've given me to do. And let me just encourage the men here. There is nothing more discouraging than a man suffering in a time where he can't have a job. Okay, I've seen it myself personally, and I've watched it with men in this church the last three or four years. Men, don't beat yourself up. Just get up and fight again. Get up and fight again. If they don't need your talent right now, wherever you were at, find a place that does. If you've been used to working on one talent and, and they just don't seem to need it with the economy, find another talent. You're multifaceted. Okay, I'm just speaking to the men here that may have gotten discouraged during this time. Don't give up. You keep fighting. Okay? And then lastly, we got treasures. Let's give away our treasures. I'll never forget that time I came home from break and my dad would never really let me drive his Cadillac, you know, just wouldn't let me do it. Sedan DeVille. Okay? But I came home one time and I said, Dad, where's the caddy? He said, Oh, I let somebody from the church borrow it. I'm like, the church? Can I have somebody from the church? What about me? Why can't I borrow it? And he said, oh, it was a man from the church. He had a job interview in Indianapolis, and he really felt that he could get it, and he needed a ride. And I'm like thinking to myself, well, then let him borrow mom's car or something, you know? <laughs> Why would you give him your car? But, but see, for my dad, just, his car was available for somebody else to use. Now, we're talking about being wise, okay? You don't want to probably do that with everybody, you know, but, you know, I'm just saying we need to share our treasures, Share the things that God gave us. Remember we were taught that, that if you love somebody, you share. It's better to share. Remember when we were kids? Share that toy. Whatever happened to that? We don't share anything anymore. Hardly ever do you find people sharing. Let's share again. You've got something that somebody else in this church needs. Share it with them. Help them. 
Somebody can't afford a haircut, you cut haircuts, give them a deal. If they become a beggar, then deal with it then. God doesn't bless begging, okay? But but help and share. Be the one that shares, and then if they take advantage of you, then you'll go from there. But don't just say, well, I don't want anybody to take advantage of me. You know, I'm just not going to share. No, don't start with that attitude. Deal with it after the fact. Let's be a church that gives our time, talents, and treasures. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the service. Prayer workers, would you come? We're going to dismiss in just a moment. But if you need prayer today, we're going to ask you to come and receive it, especially if you're struggling financially, nothing to be embarrassed of, ashamed of. Like I said, my dad lost a business. I've seen good Christian men lose businesses during this time. So we're going to close out in prayer. And if you need prayer for your business or increase or you're a young person, I've got people graduating college now. and They're saying, there's nothing for for my career. I just went to school for four years. We want to pray for you today. We want to pray because you still have talents. You are multifaceted. God is going to use you. And then for those who just want to dream big, maybe there's some David Greens in the house today. Maybe you're a young David Green, and you just want us to pray for you, to be successful, to put this new idea to work. We're going to pray for anyone today that just needs prayer for finances, shrewdness, stewardship. Don't leave out of here until these altar workers pray. And if you have any need, it doesn't matter what it is, any need, healing, encouragement, salvation, we want to pray with you today. Let's get ready to dismiss. Don't leave unless you pray, because I mean, unless you need it, because, because God's going to bless you today. Lord, thank you for this service. Help all those who need encouragement today to come forward, receive prayer. Let them not walk out if you're the same way they came in. Lord, and now we lift up our businesses. Would you pray 30 seconds for wherever you're employed at? And ask God to bless you in that business. To bless your managers, your bosses, the owners. Some of you work for very liberal companies. Pray that God will speak to those owners. That they'll stop using their money to support homosexual agendas and abortion and all of that. That they'll give it to missions. Come on, God. We pray for the success of our businesses. Do you know that no matter where Joseph was, he built success? in the places he was. When he worked for Potiphar, he brought success to Potiphar. When he was in the prison, he made that prison successful. And when he worked for Egypt, he was successful. This is not the first generation to deal with wickedness. Daniel was a successful governor in Babylon. Praise God. He'll use you. Even if it's a company that doesn't even care about God, God will use you there by being successful. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us this week. Help us to be successful in all we do. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Amen. Can we-